Okay. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for your patience. Good day. My name is Veronica Bjorkman, and I am the Director of Family Outreach and Support. We are so happy and excited that you were able to join us for our second webinar of the 2023 Summer Webinar Series. We are thrilled to collaborate and co-host this year's Summer Series with our colleagues in the Office of Undergraduate Student Life. In July and August on Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern, our offices will host a webinar leading up to new student orientation or NSOP and family orientation. A few housekeeping items before we begin. The information discussed in today and throughout our webinars is specific to undergraduate students in Columbia College, Columbia Engineering, and their families. Our panelists will present for about 30 to 40 minutes, and we will leave time at the end for questions. In the Zoom webinar platform, you may ask a question via the Q&A submission box. Given the large number of participants in today's webinar, unfortunately, we will not be able to answer every question, um, but we are also recording this webinar for families who cannot make it, and you can always reach out to us to ask us any questions or review the video at Family at Columbia on YouTube in a few days. So let's get started. Joining us today from the Office of Undergraduate Student Life is the Assistant Director for Student Engagement, Naja Muhammad. Hi, Naja. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Morning, sure. Everybody. Sure. I would also like to welcome our administrative coordinator, coordinator for the Office of Student and Family Support, Joanne Neal. Hi, Joanne. Good morning, everyone. Awesome. And then our Associate Dean of Student and Family Support, Matthew Potashnik. Good morning, Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. I would now like to welcome our special guest panelists. Joining us today is Mike Hall, the Executive Director of Financial Aid. Hi, Mike. Good morning, Veronica, and good morning, everyone. John Hannon, the Director of Student Service and ID Center. Good morning, John. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Columbia. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Kia Woods, the Assistant Director for Student Service and ID Center. Hi, Kia. Hi, Veronica. Good morning, and thank. Uh, welcome to Columbia. Wonderful. Well, now I'm going to turn it over uh, today's presentation to Mike, John, and Kia. So take it away, folks. Okay. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, well, everybody, welcome. And yeah, let me add, I don't think I said, welcome to Columbia. This is a true honor to have all of you joining us at, uh, at this fantastic university. Uh, but there is a lot to learn to, to get you up to speed. And that's part of what today is about. Uh, so today we're going to talk about three different departments at Columbia, uh, as well as two different systems uh, that, that you'll use in interacting with, with these departments. Uh, and, and all this is on some level around uh, the bill itself. So uh, first we'll talk about uh, our, the office I represent, uh, Financial Aid and Educational Financing. Uh, we'll also talk about Student and Financial Services, which is um, a little bit of a back office, but they, they do certainly work with students as well. They actually run billing, uh, refunds, and, and different aspects of that. Uh, and then we also have John and Kia from the Student Service Center with us today, who really are the folks to help you navigate uh, some, you know, issues revolving or involving student financial services as well as the Registrar's Office. And then we'll also talk about SSOL, or Student Services Online, which is where you actually find billing info. Uh, as well as Virgil, which is a newer system to the university that you may be interacting with uh, as part of this. So first, let me tell you a little bit about what our office does, just a really quick overview. Uh, so our office in financial aid and educational financing, the biggest thing is that you know we review students for their eligibility for both institutional funds as well as federal and state funds, and we also assist in the processing of outside scholarships. And we're here um, not just for that determination and, and sort of processing, but we're also here to counsel and advise families on what their options are, how different things work, um, you know, with, with the different sources of financial aid. So, so we're here uh, both as you know, sort of you know, the people who process the aid, but also as the advisors and in uh, giving you some help on figuring out what what are your your options that are available. We'll talk about a number of those today. Uh, but we can certainly talk with you about your individual situation later. And then troubleshooting, right? So uh, generally, a lot of students are getting aid from multiple different places and how all that interplays with each other. We're here to help uh, figure out that. Uh, that being said, there is a number of functions we um, we work with our partners in the SSC about. And for that, uh, I will turn it over to, to John. All right, everybody. So I'm the director for the Student Service Center, and we're really an advisory uh, organization on campus to help students and their parents 
um, you know, when they have questions about things related to student billing, registration, you know, student records, um, if you have questions about your bill, and I'm sure many, if not most of you will, um, like what's on it, how to pay it, uh, questions like that, we're here to help. So um, we also are here for the students, um, if they have questions about um, requests concerning the registration process, the courses that they are trying to add or drop, um, the way that our systems work, and they can call us, they can email us, and they can also come into our office. There's a lot of different ways to reach us. Um, one of the other major functions of our office is that we process a lot of different document requests. So we are here to help uh, produce transcripts, uh, academic certifications, we distribute diplomas um, you know, when they graduate. Uh, we can prov provide uh, invoices and all sorts of other forms and letters that a lot of students and their families need for, for various different things. Um, the other main function of our office is that we print all the ID cards for the Morningside campus and the students. So, you know, when your students arrive, we're the office that will have produced those ID cards, although the students will be getting those, you know, from the school or, or from housing. So just a couple of different points of like other things we do. I think I've covered most of this stuff. Um, but, you know, I think the, the meat of what you guys are probably interested in is the billing process. So um, if we go to the next slide. So, all right, I'm going to give you guys like a pretty high level overview of the billing and payment system. Our contact information is going to be provided at the end of the presentation. So, again, you can get in touch with us. We're easy to find. But um, a billing statement is generated each month. Um, it can be accessed. It'll be emailed to the student and anyone that the student um sets up as an authorized payer. So the student is responsible for setting up their parents or whoever as authorized payers within the uh, within the student portal. Um, one of the things you might notice when you start getting these statements in August is that um, they're sort of, uh, they're really like estimates. Like a lot of times the actual billing doesn't true itself up until a little bit later. So you're gonna see something on here and we'll explain it. It's called anticipated charges and credits and those are estimates. So on the next slide, we've got, um, it's an example of what you're going to see. And this is what, this is what's going to arrive in your email. So every month, uh, a statement or what we call an e-bill is issued to you by our partner, Nelnet. Um, it's going to be sent to the student's university email address. And it's also going to be sent to the email address that anyone has set up as an authorized payer. Again, this is, um, this is a monthly snapshot in time. Once this form is generated, it's like receiving a bill in the mail. It's a PDF. It's static. This actual document once you get it will not will not change um it's a screen it's a it's a snapshot so it the other thing i want to make clear on this too and you know i'll cover this in a little bit but this is only going to show activity that happened between the one statement and the next so it shows incremental changes over the month it never really gives you a comprehensive rundown of what you've been charged or what you've paid so um a lot of parents and students find that a little bit confusing so i just want to put that out there for you guys um, after the date that you see on the balance and the balance is printed on this statement, the statement on the student account may, and especially early in the term, August and September, often is different from what you'll see on this. Um, so you need to be aware that sometimes too, like changes in housing, dining, financial aid, or other charges or credit don't always appear on each one of these statements. Now, we talked a little bit before about anticipated charges. So you'll see on this at the bottom, it says anticipated activity. So you're going to be given um, an estimate on the early, uh, on the first e-bill statement that's going to help you figure out like how to line up what you need to do to pay the bill, whether or not you want to sign up for a payment plan, what that amount is going to be, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you know, if you need to start, especially if you're an international student, I know that this information can be really important to provide to banks and stuff. You can start transferring money from overseas. So um, it's good information, but you just need to be a little bit wary that it's subject to change. Um, let me see. There are uh, the SFS website does have um, a lot of good information on it. It does have video tutorials about this kind of stuff, and you probably want to check those out. But again, we know a lot of people find this stuff to be a little bit daunting and perhaps a little bit confusing. And again, that's why we're here. So, you know, feel free to get in touch with us. All right. So um, on the next statement. So the university right now is in the process of updating and replacing its student information system. And we've uh, we've termed that Virgil, who, you know, if you guys are familiar with uh, Dante's The Inferno, who uh, leads Dante through the various circles of hell. Um, and so it's a little bit of a wry name, but that's, that's why we're calling it Virgil. Um, the university has launched the first phase of this, and it's going to be slowly replacing SSOL, although we still exist within both systems. And right now in Virgil, the only information that really gets inputted there 
or this viewable there is like student account information, names, addresses, the photograph, and that kind of stuff. Um, and that launched in April. Eventually, though, Virgil is going to house all of the registration functions, all of the account and billing information and functions. And that's going to be rolling out over the course of the next couple of years. And we're working very hard on that. And we're excited about it. But for now, SSOL, which is Student Services Online, still exists. And there are link, there's a link to SSOL or any of the menu options of the items that still reside within SSOL will take you to SSOL. So you're going to see that there's a little bit of a disconnect in the look and feel of these two things, but it shouldn't be too hard to navigate. Um, so on the next slide, we're going to give you here's a look at what SSOL looks like. And, you know, especially for the parents, we know that um, billing is really important. So parents, just so you're aware, you do not have access to this because of the student privacy protections under FERPA. There's a lot of information here that belongs to the student. And unless your student gives you their username and login information, this is not something that you're going to you're going to have access to. But for the students, this is really important. So this is the this is the account page, and there's two important links on here um, that we always like to draw student attention to. We like to educate you guys about this, and the two are the, the link on the top, and that's the view e bill, pay by e check payments plans or wires, and that's going to take you outside of SSOL into our third party like payment processor, uh, Nelnet or QuickPay as we call it, and the parents will have access to some of the information on that. And then the other page is this view student account detail by term page. So as I mentioned before, the e-bill is a PDF. It gets generated, it gets emailed to you, and then that's it. It stays the same always. Um, if you click on either of these links, though, and you go to either of the pages on here, what you're going to see is a, is a page or information that updates every day. So it's important, especially when you're starting to get close to the billing payment dates, that um, you, the parent, either through QuickPay or you, the student, either um, you could do it through QuickPay or you could do it here in SSOL, start to monitor your account for any changes. Um, we get a lot of confusion where people say, well, the e-bill said that I owed X, Y, and Z. It's an older, you know, it's an older statement. And then they make an account payment, the payment isn't cleared, and then suddenly, oh no, there's late fees and stuff like that get applied. So I would really highly recommend that the both the students and the parents get very familiar and make it part of their process and their habit to check these pages for any changes, especially up through the payment date in September when you know a lot of stuff on the account can be in flux at that. Um, for Columbia College students and undergrads, um, oftentimes once you get past that point, you're okay, but you need to still check it because there can be changes and you know nobody likes surprises. Um, let's see if we can click over to the next page. Um, so if you click on the view, this is for the students benefit or, you know, the students can, of course, work the parents through this. This is what the um, view student account detail by term page is going to look like. So you can see on the left, there's a series of charges. Um, on the right is a series of credits. Now, like I mentioned before, the e-bill only shows anything that was added to or subtracted from or changed on the bill within the previous month. This page, however, shows you a comprehensive list of all the charges and all the credits that have been made to the account, along with the dates on which they were made. And if you look at the bottom, you've got balance, you know, it'll it'll show you a, a balance. There's a net balance on here. So the net balance is always the total amount that's remaining to be paid on that account. So um, this is a really good resource for students. And it's a good way to, you know, sort of allay and avoid some of the confusion that often pops up around the billing. But again, if you have questions, contact us. Um, this is just, again, a quick table you know you guys will see this this um you can check this out later but again it's just a comparison of the e-bill statement what it does and not do well and then the other two pages that are available to you and what they do do well which i think is a lot more than what the e-bill does well all right so university health um so oh wait which uh yes, yes okay so you're gonna see that there's gonna be a lot of charges a lot of fees that are that are Build to your account. Um, most of these fees are mandatory. They're associated with enrollment. They hit the account when registration happens. Registration is really the key to all of the billing. Um, so you, if your student goes in and checks right now, they're probably not registered for classes. So you're not going to see a lot in SSOL yet until that registration happens. But um, a lot of these fees, they are mandatory. They are not waivable. We do get a lot of questions about that, but um, we are not at liberty to take them off of the account. Um, one of the things in particular that causes a lot of confusion is that there are potentially two different charges around health insurance and health fees. One is the actual health insurance. Now, the health insurance can be waived um, if you have a qualifying health insurance plan that covers your student. 
Um, you should apply for that waiver if this is something that applies to you as soon as possible. Um, there are a lot of waivers coming into that office. The earlier that you get that waiver granted, the sooner that charge will come off or perhaps not even appear in your account at all. Um, and this often causes a lot of grief with parents and students too, is that they've applied for the waiver. They see that the fee is still on there. It's not an automatic process. There are humans who are like reviewing this. It takes them a minute. Um, one of the things I would encourage you also around Columbia is sometimes it pays to be a little bit patient. Um, and that a lot of these things do resolve themselves, but you have to realize that like we will be in a crunch time. All these offices are in a crunch time. Um, and there's, you know, just there are people who are doing this and it just takes time to get through it. The other thing that comes up a lot is the health and related services fee. That is distinct and different from the um, health insurance. It is a fee that provides all sorts of on-campus and online uh, health services that is not waivable. Every student is charged that at least at some level, depending on what program there is, even if they're studying overseas or if they're in an online program, part-time, full-time, everyone pays it. Um, it cannot be taken off the account and it is not the same as the health insurance. So if you granted a health insurance waiver, you're still gonna see the health and related services fees on that bill. Um, other things like student activity fees, um, those are on there. You'll see a couple of one-time fees on the very first bill for the fall, you're gonna be charged a document fee of $105. That provides the student a lifetime of support from our office in terms of production of transcripts, certifications, uh, us putting our signature to all sorts of forms and documents. Most other universities charge a per document fee for that. Columbia does not. Once you pay that for the rest of your life, you've got that service from, from our office. Um, and then there'll be an orientation fee, which you know provides all sorts of you know, in-person and virtual activities that help you transition um, into the university. All right. Um, next, I think I just basically covered this stuff. This will show you what the costs are for the health insurance if your student's going to be using that. Um, again, if you do have comparable coverage, and most of you do, your student's still probably able to be covered under your own health insurance, apply for that waiver as soon as possible. Do it, like get off this call and do it today. The sooner you do it, the 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 faster it happens for your account and that charge won't appear. And um, I think uh, you'll be happier that you took care of it earlier. I think I covered most of the other stuff on here. All right, credit balances. So we we get questions about this a lot. Um, if for some reason your account has been um, overpaid, you may be due to have a refund. Um, one of the things that we see a lot is that you need to know though that when if a if a credit balance is on the account and it's the result of some of anticipated charges. Until those, I'm sorry, anticipated credits, until those credits become actual credits, which is like the disbursement of financial aid, all that kind of stuff, um, those like credit balances do not result in a refund. So the refund process isn't really going to start until like after the middle or end of September when the when the actual bill has been paid. At that point, all the accounts have been true. So I would take a credit balance up until that point with a grain of salt. Um, before you start expecting a refund. So once you get past that, maybe you can start planning on that money for whatever, but until you get to that point, um, I wouldn't necessarily expect it. Let's see. All right. Um, one of the things about refunds is if you do have a credit balance, what you're going to want to do is have the student log into SSOL and within SSOL or Virgil, go to SSOL, and then you'll see that there's a refunds page that. The refunds page um, has functionality on it that you can request that your account be submitted to the refund review process. You need to follow that step. I don't believe that these for Columbia College are, are automatic at this point. Um, some of the other schools are, but if you do have that, if you do have a credit balance and you see that you've got a credit balance and you want that money refunded, um, go to the refunds page, follow the directions on it. You also have the option if you have a refund to have that refund carry forward into another term to cover um, to cover future expenses. You can opt for that as well. And I recommend because students oftentimes, especially between years or over summers or changing addresses or moving, um, if you don't sign up for direct deposit, the refund is going to get sent as a check to whatever your most recent local address was. Uh, which might not be where you are anymore. Like you may be somewhere else for an internship. You might've gone home. You might've moved within New York City. I don't know. Um, but I recommend the direct deposit. It's it's faster. It's more secure. You will get the money and then you don't have to worry about like, where am I at any given time? Um, and of course, there's all kinds of information on the, on the SFS website about refunds and all that process. Um, so let's see, becoming an authorized payer. Okay, 
So parents, this is for you and students, you need to pay attention to this too. Um, our office does not control and cannot grant or revoke the status of being an authorized payer on an account. That access is, uh, and the granting of that access is granted to, um, is granted to the students only. Uh, the students control that, they will set you up. Um, they have to log into SSOL, they need to go to the account page and there's a link for author, oh no, they go into, um, they'll go into uh, quick pay and within there's a link to authorize a payer. They can authorize any number of payers they want. So like if grandma or grandpa wanna make payments on their behalf and they wanna do it electronically as opposed to mailing a check-in, um, you can set them up. I've seen people set up um, people at their employers, the parents' companies. Um, you have a lot of leeway here, it's up to you. Um, when a parent is set up for um, an authorized payer, someone set up for an authorized payer, that person will start receiving bills in, the ma in their email. So every month when the e-bill is sent out, it will also be sent to any authorized payers as well as the student, but it does not grant um, wider access to student information, to only the billing information that's viewable within QuickPay. Um, this is just a quick, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you guys can do this. You can also call us. It's also pretty self-explanatory. It's a web form, but this is what the pages look like within QuickPay to authorize the payers, you know, and they'll see a list. The student can also choose to delete um, the payers. Parents, you're going to get an individual link to do this yourself, and you're going to be able to set up your password. Uh, try not to lose that password. I don't believe the students can change it, but if for some reason you forget the password, the student can delete that access and re-enable it. And then that's how they can, like, if you do lose your password for some reason or forget what you set it up as, or someone forgot what it was, um, again, our office can't change that. Um, the student has to delete that access and then set you back up a second time. You'll get a new link. You'll be able to enter a new password. And then that's the process for that. Um, again, quick pay, right? This is just a, a link that you're going to get. And you guys will get familiar with that. Um, and then I think at this point, that's everything I've got. And we hand this back over to, uh, to Michael. Oh, no, wait, this is payment plan. Nope, I got ahead of myself. So, sorry, financing options. All right. So students can have their accounts paid for in several different ways. Like there, there are a lot of students who have sponsors. Sponsors can be a government, a company, something like that. There's a separate process that you need to fill out paperwork to become um, a sponsored student. You're going to want to contact sponsored billing at columbia.edu and review the steps online for what that is. Um, our office doesn't really support that. Um, we can do some very basic troubleshooting in that regard, but you're going to want to make sure that you get in contact again as soon as possible, like the health insurance account. The sooner you start this process, know that there's a limited number of people who are processing all of this stuff. The earlier you get these things in, the better off you're going to be. Um, there's also loans, grants, outside scholarships, which is really more financial aid. Again, you're going to want to contact Michael's office for that stuff. We're more functional about day-to-day -day billing. We don't really have the knowledge to help you guys with financial aid questions. So um, please make sure that you're, you know, you're contacting the right office to make sure that you're getting a, a, a response in a timely amount of time. Because we all do, again, I keep stressing this, but we, you know, we have crunch time coming up. So we do our best to answer everything as fast as possible. But if you're contacting the right office right from the get-go, um, you're, you're gonna get an answer faster. Um, so what the university does offer though, that we do help with in our office is the payment plan. You can sign up for the payment plan either for the full year, or you can sign it up for um, for each individual each individual term. Um, the full year doesn't really spread the payments out over the year. They the semesters are still broken up separately. But what that's going to do is break it up potentially into five different payments. And the earlier you sign up for it, the more payments you're able to spread it out over. Um, for the fall, the payment plan starts in August, which is a little bit early considering you guys won't even have a bill yet. Um, so you may, you're probably going to be looking at this for more like September, October, November, December. Um, if you sign up for the payment plan after you've, after some of these payments have happened, the university does make you make, they call it a down payment. Um, it's not really all it is. You have to make all the missed payments, um, at upfront when you sign up for the payment plan, there's a nominal fee for signing up for it. That fee is paid to Nelnet. It's actually not paid to Columbia. Um, you know, so just be aware of that when you sign up, there is a small processing fee for that. Um, so let's see, what have we got in here? Uh, it's different options, game plan. Right. So the one thing you want to know is that um, the payment plan, one of the nice things about it, apart from being able to like stretch out your payments, not have to pay this all up front, is that it does put you in kind of a separate bucket from other students um, in that as long as you're enrolled in the payment plan and you're making the payments on the payment plan, you're not subject to late fees or holds. Um, 
the payment plan, you're going to want to make sure, though, that you do sign up for that if you want to avail yourself of it before September 22nd, which is when the bill is due. Because beyond that point, um, you know, first of all, you need to make a very large down payment right up front. But um, beyond that, um, if you're not in it and you miss the September payment plan, you will be subject to 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 a late fee. Um, so I would, again, if you know and you have a good estimate and with Columbia College, you should basically know what it's going to cost. The information is also all on SFS's website. There's a tuition and fees website so you can get an estimate and calculate what you're going to owe. You may want to sign up for the payment plan as early as possible. Um, you've got a couple of other payment methods. Um, if you have a U.S. bank account and a U.S. address, um, e-check e is preferred as the method of payment. Um, if you're an international student, we provide several different options for third party wire processors. Um, we get asked a lot for the direct billing information, the wire information for the bank. We don't distribute that very easily. Um, the, there can be some exceptions depending, especially if you're in certain countries where the banking system is unreliable or there's like, you know, if you're from like say like Ukraine and there's a war or something like that, that that information can be provided. But generally the university shies away from providing that information and really prefers that you use the either Convera, pay my tuition or Flywire. Um, the conversion rates are all basically the same through all three. You can do a comparison, but they generally come in at the same. There's not a lot of, um, you know, reason to not do that. Or we get all kinds kinds of requests for it. But, um, you know, the benefit, I think, too, of using the methods that are through quick pay, as opposed to trying to go out and do it directly through your bank or some other organization, is that um, those payments take longer to reach us. They get credited to the account later. And again, um, a lot of people initiate the payments closer to the payment due date. Wire, this is really mostly for international students, but wires take up to five business days, Oftentimes, students miss the payment date as a result of this and end up with a hold on the account, or they end up with a late fee, or you know the payment just takes a long time to get credited to the account because the right information isn't included in the notes with the wire. Um, if you use these services, either the e-check if you're a you know domestic bank account or the international payments, you get a credit for those payments immediately on your account. So you will see that show up immediately. It will alter your balance in the proper way, and we highly recommend that you use the authorized services. Um, this is just again, we're looking at we're looking at quick pay here, and you can see where the links are for you know signing up for the payment plans. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but uh, I think um, I won't go into this in great detail. But again, just so you're familiar with where you're looking, I know this can kind of sometimes be just you know it's a, it's a massive gray and blue. But um, the links are all here under payment plan when you log in, and uh, you'll see this also as an authorized payer. The one thing I do want to note is if you're an authorized payer and you sign up for the payment plan, only one of the accounts associated with the student account can initiate the payment plan. So if the student has set up the payment plan under their own login, an authorized payer is not going to be able to do that. Um, so if you're thinking about that, just make sure that you're having a conversation back and forth with whoever may be involved in financing um, your students at, and just make sure that you know who's responsible for the payment plan. And then that person's the only person who's going to be able to go in and like change the bank account information if it needs to happen or something like that. So we do run into that sometimes, too, where like a, they'll change the bank account information or put the money in a different account. Uh, the student can't change it or the plan is under the student's name and the parent can't change it. So just make sure that the line of who's responsible for that within your own situation is, is pretty clear. Um, and again, questions of that, you can always contact us. Um, this is just more information about like clicking through and setting up the payment plan. Again, there's information on this on the website and we're always here to, we walk a lot of people through this because a lot of people find it, find it pretty confusing. So, um, you know, get in touch with us. I think one of the other things, uh, what do we have? The, the only other thing I want to mention is we do get requests throughout the term um, to either modify the payments or cancel specific payments in the payment plan. That's something that we're able to do. However, um, we've, we're no longer able to cancel individual payments after the third payments. For the fourth and fifth payments, if we're getting a request to cancel those payments, we only terminate the plan at that point. So um, once you get past the third payment, which is the October payment coming up for the fall, we will not cancel either just the November or just the December payment plan. Um, the, pl the plan and uh, just the payment, the plan in total is going to get terminated. It won't be it won't be something that we can modify. So we do get those requests. It's just this is a new thing, but just you know keep that in mind if that's something that comes up. 
Um, when you're first signing up for the payment plan, especially now when you don't have actual charges to your account, you're going to be asked to fill out this budget worksheet. Um, what you're going to want to do here is really like consult with your financial aid office, anyone who's maybe providing scholarships or anything like that, or what people are going to be, you know, going to be paying in advance for you. That's going to be separate outside of the payment plan. So if you're getting grants or you've got your company is contributing something, and then you're going to want to use the SFS website for the tuition and fees to figure out what the total amount for the fall is going to be. You're going to put that total amount in the charges for what you're going to be, what you think you're going to be billed. And then you're going to put into, if you have any, you're going to put into the credits anything that you think is going to get paid outside of the installments that you think you're going to make on your own. Um, that's going to give you a net balance. So it's going to take those charges. It's going to subtract the credits of the value of whatever aid you think you're going to get. Um, and then that will create uh, a net balance that then is going to get divided out five times amongst the, amongst the payments. So um, before you go in and do this, just do a little due diligence on the website, you know, maybe talk to Mike's team or you can ask us if you've got questions about, you know, where to find this information or what it's going to be. And we can certainly help you with that. Okay, thanks, John. I guess uh, my turn to take over at this point, right? So, so Student Financial Services can certainly work with you in the SSC on the payment plan. That is a great option. We actually recommend it to families, uh, you know, if you're not able to sort of make the big lump sum payments. Um, because there's no interest on the payment plan. It, it, it's a great option in that regard, and you wrap things up by the end of the year. However, we do realize some families do need to borrow uh, for their educational expenses. And, uh, and this is something that's open if you're receiving a, a institutional grants. We've actually not packaged loans in your financial aid award, so these are still options to cover uh, the remaining balance if you decide you want to do that. And for families who didn't apply for institutional aid, you can still apply for uh, federal loans or pursue the private loan options as well. Uh, and if you decide to do that, you, uh, it, there's actually some great options out there. The, the first and the best is the federal direct uh, student loan. Uh, this generally is going to have the best terms out there for an unsecured loan. Uh, you're not putting up any collateral. Uh, the loan is in the student's name, and there, there's just some great terms overall. So the interest rate, it's a little bit higher now as rates have started to go up. So 5.5% uh, for loans uh, borrowed this coming year. That will be a fixed interest rate, so that's good. Um, and there, for some students, if you have what are what's called subsidized loan eligibility, which is something we can our office can uh, talk with you about, the interest actually doesn't even start accruing until the student is done with their studies. So, uh, so that, that's a really nice aspect of that. But regardless, you know, you don't have to make any payments at all until the student is done, um, you know, with their studies or is graduated, uh, you know, uh, from Columbia. Okay, uh, but the downside is, is the first year you can only borrow five thousand five hundred. So that that doesn't always go very far uh, for a lot of families. But it could just be just enough that you need, uh, or if you want the you know the student to have uh, some amount of responsibility, it, you know, without going overboard, it, it's a nice nice option there. Beyond that, there is the federal um, parent plus loan, and this is a loan in the parent's name, right? So the, the first loan I talked about is in the student's name. It is limited in terms of how much can be borrowed, uh, but there is a loan, uh, federal loan option for parents uh, that actually you can borrow up to the full cost of attending Columbia minus any other aid that the student has. So, so this can be a, a good option for families who, who do want to do more substantial borrowing. Uh, it is a federal loan. I can tell you the approval process for this is effectively, you know, it's it's on the back end, they check to see if you have any negative credit history in the sense of like, do you have a bankruptcy? Uh, and if it, you effectively, if you don't have a bankruptcy or something, you know, very significantly bad in your credit history, uh, you will likely be approved for this loan uh, for whatever amount that, that you need up to the cost of attendance uh, with this. The interest rate is a little bit higher. Uh, again, they've been going up and this year, it's going to be 8%. Um, so you know, you might want to consider a private loan market to see if you can find a slightly lower rate. You're not going to find anything drastically lower than this on the private loan market. Uh, sometimes other families will consider things like home equity loans if they can find a better rate through their banks uh, and things like that. But uh, the plus loan is a great option. It is fairly straightforward and easy to do. Very quick turnaround on those. Um, and you know, you can have two options for repayment. You can actually start repayment immediately. Uh, or you could defer repayment until after the student is finished with their studies as well. Um, that being said, the interest is going to accrue and capitalize over time there. So uh, we don't always uh, recommend the families wait until after graduation so that uh, to keep the, the balance overall lower. Okay, so if you're interested in these in loan options, uh, you can find on our website there, 
uh, some great options. So this is uh, the specific loan website for our office where uh, you'll find the information, uh, most updated information, as well as uh, some of the application processes for these. I won't get into that for anybody who's not necessarily interested. Um, you know, it, there are a couple of steps, but it's not overly complex, but that's where you're going to find the information. Okay. So another way to help pay down the bill uh, is actually through work study uh, or, or the student getting a job on campus. So, so students who have applied for institutional aid most likely or in a number of cases do have either one of two things on their financial aid eligibility letters. The first is it'll say either federal work study or the other is it'll say student employment. The major difference here is who's actually paying the student's wages. So if it's federal work study, then the federal government is actually paying part of the student's wages. Uh, and if it just says student employment, you know, that's the idea that, well, you, you get a different job on campus where effectively the department uh, that you'd be working for is paying all of your wages. So, so in, in some sense, it's more of a back-end distinction, uh, but there are some jobs that are work federal work study eligible only and other jobs where it doesn't matter. You can be federal work study or you can be casual and, and, and either is fine there. Uh, so if you have federal work study on your eligibility letter, um, you do qualify for that and you would want to go to the work study office uh, to actually find the listings of the jobs and apply for those jobs. Generally, we wait for new students to wait till closer to orientation, uh, in-person orientation, move in, so they have an idea of what their schedules are before they start reaching out for these departments. Um, for casual or student employment uh, purposes, you can find those postings on the Center for Career Education's website. So they've got some nice uh, options there. And, that, and for departments who are hiring, and it really doesn't matter if you have uh, work-study eligibility or not, that's where you're going to find those jobs posted. Uh, and also related to this, uh, students get paid for work study with a bi-weekly paycheck. So you're, you're not going to see any work study awards or anything on your actual bills. What happens is every other week, the students, as they're filling out their timesheets, they actually get payments made directly to them, uh, just like anybody else you know, with, with a job. You know, Taxes will be withheld. You'll go through direct deposit in most cases and things like that. Okay. Uh, outside scholarships. So this is just something it, it's worth touching on. Our office will work with you on these. We do ask students to report all these to us because we find out about them one way or another, and they do impact other aid at times. Uh, at Columbia, uh, an important thing to talk about is how they impact uh, institutional grants. So the key thing is that they can replace a student's student contribution, the summer earnings portion of that. Uh, they can also replace the, the student employment or the federal work study portion of their award. Uh, but after that, they can start to reduce your Columbia grant. So roughly, you know, five to six thousand or so is what most students can receive in outside funding before it starts to impact their other grants. And the example I have here, we've got an eight thousand dollar scholarship uh, the students bring in from non-Columbia sources, uh, and so that would reduce a student contribution twenty four hundred, which is the typical contribution there. That would reduce the typical uh, student employment amount of three thousand ninety. And then it would actually reduce the Columbia grant by 2,510. So, so that, that is the policy. We do ask everybody to be upfront with us about this stuff so we can figure it out on the front end. Um, but when the funds do come and they hit the student account, we see them. We do have to make adjustments whenever we do see them hit the, the student account there. We also have a couple other quick policies. If you are going to be in a situation like this one with, say, like an $8,000 scholarship, uh, a very common one is using these funds to purchase a computer. Uh, now, you do have to sort of purchase it with your own funds up front, but then what happens is you provide us a receipt of that computer purchase uh, up to $1,500, and then we can not reduce your Columbia grant by that much, right? So in this case, let's say this student with this $8,000 award went out, they spent the maximum $1,500 on a computer, they give us that receipt, then we would only reduce their uh, Columbia grants by $1,010 in, in that particular case. So, okay, uh, so let's see, future planning. Uh, financial aid is one of those things uh, that you do have to apply for every year. Generally, October 1st is the big kickoff day for everything, uh, as you probably noted this past year. Uh, for this coming year, a little bit different. Um, the, profile, the CSS profile will still launch on time on October 1st. However, the Department of Ed has let us know the FAFSA is not going to launch until sometime in December. So they are going to be delayed. Uh, it is hopefully going to be a much simpler process. Uh, there are going to be some number of changes. We will be in touch with families about that later in the fall. Um, but they have noted that they are going to be late with their launch there. Uh, so we do ask everybody to try and like get their stuff done by February 1st, you know, but really the deadline is, is uh, May 5th every year. So the earlier you get in, the better chance we have to get everything out, get you your, your aid uh, for following years in the, the first batches. 
Okay, uh, let's see. And, and one other quick statement, as long as your family situation financially remains pretty consistent with income and assets and the number of household members and number of people in college and things like that, then your aid will be consistent. Um, any changes to those, and there might be a proportional change to the financial aid. But again, those are things our office can review with you, uh, but most families find as long as things are pretty stable, and there's not you know a big jump in income or something like that, uh, that their aid does stay pretty stable year over year there. Okay, uh, special circumstances, we understand life happens. Please tell us everything. Um, hopefully you did that in this initial round, but again, in the reapplication process, uh, let us know as much as you can about what's going on with your family and we will take as much of that into account as we can. Um, there are some limits to how much we can take things into account, but we will do our best to uh, get everything covered. And with that, I will turn it back over. I think uh, maybe Kia, are you gonna take this one here? Yes. Hi, good morning again, everybody. So I'm just gonna go over quickly um, some very important dates that you should remember. Um, to sign up for the payment plan, uh, you have to sign up before or um, no later than September 22nd, which is the due date for the, the balance that you may owe. Um, you can enroll in the payment plan um, now if you choose to, there will be no down payment, um, but if you enroll after August 3rd, there, like John explained to you, you're gonna have a higher balance to pay. Um, if you sign up after October 28th, it will require a 80% down payment of the balance. So just keep those things in mind um, when you uh, are uh, working out your uh, billing stuff. And then we just have another couple more. So you'll be emailed the first Even bill will go out August 14th. Again, like John said, this may or may not have all of your charges, but for Columbia College, it should have an anticipated amount that's due. And that's gonna be on August 14th. The due date is September 22nd. For the full balance owed, if you're not enrolled in a payment plan, um, and we encourage you to uh, become an authorized payer as early as August 14th as well. Uh, and as Michael said, the earlier you apply for, um, reapply for financial aid, more monies um, are available. So the earlier you do it, the better it is for you. Um, thank you again. And um, thank you for joining us and have a pleasant day. So we've got some questions that we want to review while we're all together, and we've been trying to answer as many questions as we can via the Q&A tool. We have more questions than we will be able to get to today, and, and we're sort of used to that with this webinar. So we will do our best to respond um, to as many questions as we can in our remaining time. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we know that there was a lot of information. You can refer back to it, and we will send out all of the links and all of the resources. So you will very easily be able to find everything that we talked about today. But Mike, the first question is actually one about financial aid. Can you talk about how students and families can interact with financial aid? Are they assigned in a financial aid advisor? Uh, can parents and families talk to financial aid with or without the student? How do families and students access um, an individual in financial aid? Yeah, sure. Lot, uh, lots of good questions there, there, Matthew. So first off, students are not assigned to a particular financial aid uh, advisor in the office, uh, and there's pros and cons to that uh, both ways, but it means that someone's available pretty much all the time to work with you. We do realize some families sort of gravitate to certain staff members or you know call back, and, and that's fine when that happens. Um, but for outreach to us, we've got two methods here uh, on the slide here, uh, emailing our office, that's our general phone number. But actually, if you go to our website on the contact us, uh, there's also a link for setting up virtual appointments as well. Uh, and we offer those both obviously in English, but also in Spanish for parents who English is not their first language, but they're more comfortable in Spanish. Uh, so those are all ways to reach out to us. I mean, feel free, whether you're an institutional aid recipient or not, like whatever it is, reach out any time of year. We're here, you know, uh, throughout the entire year to talk about either the application process, the current aid that's there, uh, to review loan options, uh, whatever the case is, that's all available. Uh, we do meet both students by themselves, parents by themselves, and students and parents together. I, I think we generally find that the more productive conversations involve both students and parents. Uh, just because parents might sometimes have a better understanding of what's going on with the finances that the aid is being based on. Um, but uh, also times, you know, students are becoming 
uh, adults and you know, uh, at different times are taking this on is their own responsibility. So, um, so I, I guess all of the above is we're happy to work with um, in that regard. Great. We are getting a lot of questions about the payment plan and sort of uh, students and families trying to make meaning out of the fact that um, when the, the sort of amount owed when students and families sign up for the payment plan may change over the course of um, the semester as enrollment um, decisions are made, as meal plans are changed, things like that. So when there is a change in the amount owed, how is the payment plan rebalanced or is it rebalanced? And how can families adapt to changes on the student account via the payment plan? Right. Okay, um, so I'll... Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I'll take that one. Um, so with the payment plan, it is going to adjust according to a rebalancing schedule. Um, so usually 10 days before or after the payment plan will be adjust up or down. So it's really tricky. That's why John really emphasized how important it is to view the student account detail by term on SSOL because then this will give you an idea of when things are happening. But if you're going by the statement, you're not going to see these different adjustments. So um, when the, like say the health insurance is adjusted, if it happens before the payment plan schedule is scheduled to rebalance, it won't be reflected. But if it happens after and the payment plan is scheduled to rebalance, it will be reflected. So it's really difficult to say when exactly things are gonna happen it's just important for you to note that it will adjust up or down at different times and it's based on the schedule. And so we encourage everyone to really just view student account detail by term because you'll see it. And again, like John said, you can always email us and say, you know, my payment plan, I, you know, the, the health insurance was removed. Can you adjust my plan to reflect that? And we'll be able to tell whether or not we need to adjust it or leave it as is because it's going to adjust on its own. Yeah. And the thing is, by the end of the term, too, they, they adjust every month on or around the 20th, I think, is the date. Yeah, 10 days. Right. Yeah. So um, you're going to see that that you're if anything changes, say, like up to that point, whether it's an additional payment or the removal of a charge or the addition of a charge the payment plan will adjust itself. And I, I'm not sure, I don't think this really like applies to you guys, because um, I think the undergraduate housing is different, but if you're in a housing plan that gets charged month to month, you do need to, that gets a little weird with the payment plan. So like the payments will start to balloon throughout the term. So just be aware of that. Um, but I think uh, for the most part, again, like I said earlier, in terms of some of these things, sometimes it pays to be a little patient. So like if there is a change, um, even if it doesn't impact the next payment plan payment, it will be reflected in the one after that. So like if you make an additional payment and the one payment's a little higher, the subsequent payments are all just going to be lower. So, you know, you might see a little like, you know, it returns to the mean, right? But like it does, um, it does adjust itself every month around the 20th. And just a quick point, That's clarification point. there for John, is that um, our housing for all students in the College of Engineering is going to be billed at a flat rate at the beginning of the semester. Okay, so. doesn't impact you guys. I yeah. completely forget what I just said. It never happened. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, Mike, we are getting some additional questions about work study and mm -hmm. questions about when uh, students who have received a work study award, when can they start working? And uh, some questions about understanding fundamentally what is work study. It's actually money that the student will receive via paycheck to cover um, some of their life expenses. But could you maybe just give a quick um, review of what the purpose of work study is? When can students start working and how do they sort of use um, the money they receive as work study um, to support their life at Columbia? Sure, yeah. Um, so students, I mean, technically among the continuing students, we actually already have students working right now um, you know, from, from current students who are not, not new students, uh, they're already accessing their federal work study funds and working on campus right now in some cases. So, so there really isn't uh, an early time, although I think most new students, it's typical to, um, you know, to look, at, certainly look at the jobs right now, get, you know, log into the, the federal work study website or the, the work study office website to see what's available right now. You could do that without a problem. Um, Generally, most new students, so you do want to sort of see what your fall schedule is going to be looking like, which happens that first week of orientation once you you come in to move in, uh, before you actually start like working with jobs. Because one of the first things going to happen when someone applies for a job is they're going to say, well, when can you work? Like, what, what's your schedule look like? And if you don't have your schedule, 
that just sort of becomes problematic with departments who are looking for someone who can cover these certain hours of the day. Uh, so that's when to start looking for it. You know, you can certainly browse right now, but I would wait until or you're physically on campus before you start to actually apply for jobs. Related to that, you can also just reach out to departments too, even if you don't see a posting. And, you know, if there's something you're really interested in working with, like, you know, um, you know, you can certainly ask and see what it is. They may say, oh, well, yeah, we're going to post it in another week or two or something like that. So um, so I would encourage new students to, you know, if there's something you really want to do, the, to, to sort of approach those departments. Um, in terms of how it works, yeah, it, you, you'll set up direct deposit. It's separate from the direct deposit that uh, John and Kia were just talking about. So there's actually multiple direct deposits sometimes people have to set up at Columbia. Um, so this is through HR's direct deposit. But then, yeah, every other week you get a paycheck. And, you know, the idea with that from a perspective is a lot of times the, the work study earnings go to fund what we call the unbilled expenses. So, you know, that may be books at the beginning of the semester. That's going to be, you know, you're just sort of living expenses of, you know, beyond uh, room and meals here on campus, right? So you want to, you're in New York, you want to go to Midtown and, you know, go see a show or a game or, or whatever else, like, you know, you, you just sort of spend that money or if you just need, um, you know, toiletries, you know, the idea is that that becomes money that you're spending on all the unbilled expenses. Um, sometimes families do just figure out a way to sort of where the student is, you know, either earning that and they're paying that as part of the payment plan or different things like that. But um, really, that's a decision up to the student and the family to figure out where those funds will go towards um, when you get into the term. Okay. Um, we also have a slew of questions about 529 plans. And uh, I know that there's a comprehensive website with all the information, but one question that's come up a couple of times are, is the intersection of 529 and the payment plans. And um, do you have any good advice for families who are working with a 529 provider and who will still owe money every semester? And how do you sort of account for payments made through 529 and families interested in being on the payment plan at the same time? Uh, I think if you know that you're going to have a certain amount paid through the payment plan, and I showed you the worksheet with the budget worksheet where you put in your estimates, enter that amount in there and it will subtract from the payment plan. Um, of course, you then have to make that 529 payment in a timely manner so that it's actually reflected on your account or the like Kia just spoke about, like the payment plan is going to say um, the estimate was X, the amount owed is actually Y, which is more than X, and the payments are going to adjust upwards until that 529 payment gets made, at which point the payment plan will adjust itself down. So the payment plan, again, like it, it, it accounts for these things. Um, if you know that you're going to be making that payment and you know that you're going to be initiating that payment from the payment plan early in the term um, and you're signing up for the payment plan, include it in your estimate. Um, if you don't think that you're going to be making that payment this year, you're unsure, I wouldn't include it. I think, um, you know, it's it's a little bit of a spongy thing to give advice on because the, you know, the situation is probably pretty, pretty specific. But um, I don't like I've not yet seen anywhere that like a payment plan is like, like automatic like that, where it's, it can be included or anything, but you it's going to be your own, you know, you're showing out of, your own estimate about when you're going to pay it and how much you're going to pay. And then you use that to inform the amount that you sign up for the payment plan. And then, of course, it all gets taken out of your hand anyway when the actuals all hit um, or any new payments and the payment plan is just going to adjust. So um, you don't have to do a lot of work. Like if you decide to make a payment for the 529 at a later date that you didn't think you were going to make, the payment plan is going to going to be clued into that and fix itself anyway. So okay. Um, I'm going to take one more question, and then we're going to kick it back to um, Veronica and the Tanaja to close us out. But um, we are getting some questions about um, families who may be using multiple ways to pay, a uh, combination of quick pay, family members sending in additional funds via check. Um, there are some important details that should be included in every check and um, some important information um, about connecting the payment to the student. What are those details? And if you're a parent or family member, how do you find out um, those details from your students so that we can ensure timely receipt and processing of payments? Yeah, the so most important, oh, go ahead, yeah. Sorry, so I'll, I'll take that one. Um, the most important thing is to make sure, especially if it's gonna be like a mail check that you include the student's name, uni, or student ID. Um, the student ID number is going to be the C number that is followed by nine digits zeros. The student has access to their student ID number. They, when they log on to Virgil first, um, and then they go into um, SSOL, 
they're going to choose the menu option academic profile and that's where you'll see the C number that um, starts with a C followed by nine digits. If that information is not included on the check or the deposit or wherever the money is coming from, there's just going to be money in limbo because they're not going to know who that um, money, to, who, which account is associated with that student. Um, we also encourage everyone that is doing like 529 plans or mailing in checks is that you do it as early as possible because it's being mailed to a PO box and those PO boxes, um, they're not processed immediately. So please allow at least three weeks so that we know we've received the check by the due date, not you're sending the check while the, when the due date is seven days away because it's highly likely that we're not going to receive it and the student is not going is going to have an outstanding balance and then have a hold on their account and then have late fees so we encourage everyone to do that as early as possible yeah and just you know the c number actually is included on the e-bill so if you need to find it it's on it's on the top left hand corner of the e-bill um it's listed as a student id it's pretty pretty obvious what it is and i think the other thing too is like let's say you do make a payment and grandma grandpa some local charity sends in a check or something like that and this information wasn't included um when you do email us uh as you will to be like why is this not credited to my account um please try and include either a check number or a bank transfer number if it was something that was sent electronically or like a wire confirmation number if it's being sent for overseas because us providing that information to our payments and deposits group who were responsible for like reconciling the bank accounts with all the checks and payments that come in that it's they need that like you will speed up the process of us identifying that payment and applying it to the account properly if you give us that number up front so um in case it happens which it won't because you guys are all super diligent people but no if it does happen um you know please make sure you send that information because in, it's just less back and forth with us at a busy time and if we have that information we can go right for it no that's absolutely correct john thank you i actually forgot to mention that but we also need all of the information so we need the you know the sender's information as well as the banking details so if you have the transcripts that's really the best way to do it so that we know where that money was sent because columbia has several different account numbers and if we don't know where that account is we can't trace it that way either Wow. So we have covered a lot of information. I want all of our panelists and all of our parents and families and students listening today to take a deep breath because this will all be okay. Um, I know it sounds overwhelming. I know it sounds like a lot. I know you have a lot of specific and nuanced questions. And if we weren't able to get to your specific question, feel free to reach out um, and we'll get you connected to the right person. But take a deep breath and I'm going to kick it back to Veronica. Thank you, Matthew. Unfortunately, we are out of time for additional questions. However, if you still have something that you would like to ask, you can reach out to us via email at ugrad-family at columbia.edu or ugrad student life at columbia.edu. A big thank you to Mike, John, and Kia for joining us today. And if you haven't already, please register for our next webinar, which is Friday, July 21st at 10 a.m. Eastern to learn more about Columbia Health. And to close us out, I'm going to turn it over to Nasha for a special announcement. Hi, everyone. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm not going to keep you long. I'll be very quick. I just wanted to tell you about three upcoming webinars that we have that are uh, discussing some of our student communities. Uh, the first one is our first gen low income, or as we call FLY, student webinar, which will be happening today at noon Eastern time. Um, then we have uh, two ISOP, which is our International Student Orientation Program uh, webinars that will be happening. The first one will be on Wednesday, July 19th at 7 a.m. Eastern time. And then there will be another one on Thursday, July 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. I hope you are able to join. If not, you are. there are ways for you to get in touch with us. We're very excited to have you. I look forward to seeing you in the fall. Thank you. And Nadia, these are just for students, right? These are just for students. So these are opportunities for incoming students to learn more about these different communities and the students that are a part of them as well. Wonderful. Where can they register at? Um, they should be able to register via Countdown, um, mm -hmm. Or uh, you can always look on our orientation website as well, too, um, that will provide you basically back to countdown. <laughs> I, I just put it in the chat, the link in the chat, so uh, the so last much. link. Thank you. Is well, for the FLI um, webinar. 
Perfect. Well, it's been an awesome day today. Thank you so much, everyone, and take care. Have a great weekend. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye. Meg, I'll pop down in a few.